I will Come ask on. you again, Cheryl. Yes. I've been asking you during the break. Right. I'm asking you again. And don't try and cry, because if anyone should be crying, it should be me. This is the situation. Yeah. You tell me where you have heard him say, educate me, tell me when you have heard him say racist things. E educate me, tell me. Inside of you, inside of you, how long to be is wrong to be inside of you. Oh, I thought you were going to harmonize. Oh. <laughs> Hello and welcome slash welcome back to my channel. My name is Khadija, your favorite internet play auntie. Hello to all my returning nieces, nephews, and nibblings, and my fellow aunties, uncles, and piblings. If you're new, feel free to take a look around, suss out the vibe. I just sit on my floor, talk about whatever I feel like. Sometimes I talk to my friends, and sometimes I do video essays. And today, who y'all? Sharon, Sharon, Sharon. We're gonna talk about what happened between Sharon Osbourne and Cheryl Underwood on last week's episode of The Talk. So I'm gonna be giving y'all a quick timeline of what transpired over the last couple of weeks. We're gonna talk about the incident that happened on the talk, but as usual, I'm gonna be more focused on the why of the matter versus the what. So I'm gonna examine why the word racist just gets people so riled up, why it's so hard for some people to hear. Talking about that loosely through an idea known as qualia. We're gonna bring back Dr. Mark Brackett's permission to feel and talk about the display rules that were being not necessarily exhibited, but kind of exhibited during that incident on the reel. And then I'm gonna briefly talk about the fault of default and yeah, just have some final thoughts. So uh, yeah, but before we do that, today's video is brought to you by Surfshark VPN. Now I do not know the nitty gritty, science-y, mathematically, academic -y things when it comes to how VPNs work. But I do know that websites like Surfshark are able to help you change your IP address. That's, I did my Googles. Change your IP address so that you can say you live anywhere, which works out for someone like me living in Canada, trying to watch American Netflix, AKA me trying to catch up on Pose since the third season's gonna be the last. I just need a moment. It's honestly super easy to use, easy to install, especially if you got Google Chrome, that's what I use. Just pop it up in there, change your location to one of the many countries they offer and get to watching. So get Surfshark VPN by clicking the link in my description and entering promo code MBO, that is how you say my last name since a lot of y'all were asking, to get 83% off and an extra three months free, free 99. And let's get back to the video. So what happened? If you haven't seen my video on Mary and Mary, <laughs> on Megan and Harry, check it out. If you're not trying to watch all that because it was like 50 minutes, that's totally fine. I'll give you a brief rundown. So on Sunday, March 7th, Megan and Harry did a tell all interview with Oprah and all hell kind of broke loose after that. Prince Harry and Meghan Markle. Meghan Markle yes. and Harry. Duke and Duchess of Netflix. It was billed as a tell-all. We are all on technical hooks to find out what their reaction to this is. And also concerns and conversations about how dark his skin might be when he's born. What? The next day, people were freaking out, responding left, right, and center. YouTubers were furiously recording and editing content, trying to make it go live before people forgot about it so they could make a little bit of coin. What kind of self-drag? So the next day on Good Morning Britain, Pierce Morgan was just ranting and raving for the entirety of the show, talking about how terrible the two of them were, how this is a terrible time to do this to the queen because Philip was in the hospital, how he did not believe Megan when she said that she had suffered through all sorts of depression, talking about thoughts of suicide. He just was like, I don't believe her, she's a liar. I wouldn't believe her if she was telling me the weather. Like he was going in unnecessarily. He was basically acting like the queen was his mama and that Meghan Markle had called the queen a 
<laughs> the ranting and raving and bullying that he was doing on that show got so wild that ITV got 41,000 complaints lodged against them. Anyway, in the midst of it, he ended up walking off because another one of his hosts read him for Bill. Has she said anything about you since she cut you off? I don't think she has, but yet you continue to trash her. Okay. I'm done with this. No, no, no. Sorry, no. Oh, uh, Sorry. So, do you know what? That's pathetic. You can track him, maybe not my. No, own no, no, no. See you later. I'm, I'm being. He walked off and then came back and had a conversation. But the next day, they were like, "Girl, you need to apologize." Like, what the hell was that? And he was like, "No, no. Freedom of speech. Freedom of speech. This is England. Freedom of speech. No. The Queen is is mom. No." So he quit. So anyway, how Sharon Osbourne factors into this is that Sharon and Pierce have been friends for years and she tweeted out a statement of support to him saying, I am with you, I stand by you. People forget that you're paid for your opinion and that you're just speaking your truth. Honestly, why couldn't she have just texted him if they're such good friends? Like, why did we need to know that? But I guess, you know, famous, people need to know your business. So she was promptly dragged on Twitter for that. And on Wednesday's episode of The Talk, Sharon's co-host, Cheryl Underwood, she's been a host on that show since season two and has been friends with Sharon for 11 years. She basically was asking her about this, about, I'm just gonna play the clip. It's just easier if I play the clip. What would you say to people who may feel that you, while you're standing by your friend, it appears that you give validation or safe haven to something that he has uttered that is racist. Even, even if you don't agree, am I, say, am I well, saying it right? He... And Sharon did not take that well. And for me, at 68 years of age, to have to turn around and say, I ain't racist. What's well, it gonna I... do with me? I'm a <laughs> okay? How can I be racist about anybody? How can I be racist about anybody or anything in my life? How can I? Well, 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 I well what? You, we will be right well, back. What? We have more topics, so don't go away. And I think we don't should go. stop this. Now, later, Sharon did an interview with E talking about how she felt like she was actually being ambushed during all of this because there was some pack that the women on the show had talked about years before, like a little while before, about not letting producers ambush them with topics that they maybe haven't had time to prepare for. So Sharon felt like that was what was happening. I, uh... Either way, after that, the show ended up going on a mini hiatus. And as of this recording date, it is still under a hiatus because other people that have been on the show are bringing up charges against Sharon Osbourne. Leah Remedy became the second former co-host of Sharon's to accuse her of using racist language at the talk. The season one co-host told journalist Yashir Ali, Sharon would refer to Julie Chen, who's Chinese American, as quote, wonton and slanty eyes. This days after Holly Robinson Pete said Sharon had her fired for being quote, too ghetto. Sharon denies both claims. Allegedly. CBS ended up releasing a statement saying this. We are committed to a diverse, inclusive, and respectful workplace. All matters related to the Wednesday episode of The Talk are currently under internal review. So now you're all caught up. So I think we need to unpack as best we can why the word racist sets people off so much. And it's easy to say that it's just because it's a negative connotation and people like to think good of themselves and blah, 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 blah. But as I've stated in a previous video, language has a history and a memory. And because of that, some of our more stubborn members of society, particularly those that happen to be of a certain age, they just have a hard time keeping up or a harder time keeping up, I should say. When a definition of a word they previously knew in one light changes and starts to look different in our modern time, it can be confusing and embarrassing and that confusion and embarrassment can turn into anger because people at the end of the day fear what they don't know. It even goes beyond not knowing and into our perceptions. 
even of words that have a clear and concrete sensation or definition. It kind of reminds me of this term known as qualia, which is defined as the internal and subjective component of sense perceptions arising from stimulation of the senses by phenomena. That doesn't sound like English. Okay. An example of qualia would be, I know what it feels like to have an itch. You know what it feels like to have an itch. If we went on Google right now, we could find a definition for an itch, but in our minds and in our bodies, the sensation of an itch is just going to be different and there's no way I'm gonna be able to explain to you how my itch feels versus how yours does. This can also work for a concept like love. We have definitions of love, although they vary, but I know what it's like for me to feel what love is. You know what it's like for you to feel what it is. And if you don't, I'm sorry, hopefully one day. But either way, the way we would describe that is gonna be very different. Now with the word racist, I know there are a couple of different definitions of racist and there have been policies in government based on racism or based on these different definitions of racism, which is why we keep bringing up these pesky systems of oppression that y'all are like, what? But even with clear definitions of what racism is, each of us carries our own personal history and internal context of what that word means and how that word makes us feel. Which is why I briefly mentioned the age thing because it's not an excuse in any way, shape or form, but I do have to be mindful of the fact that Sharon is a 68 year old woman. As such, she has a very different perception of what the word racist means. And the reason that I'm bringing that up is because I'm still trying to, you know, talk about and understand why that is such a triggering word for her. Because the way she responded to it, no one even called her racist. They were talking about racist talk and no one even called Pierce racist, but she heard racist mentioned around her and immediately was like, uh, so that's why I'm saying all of this. 40 years ago, Sharon Osbourne was my age and racism, looked different. Not that it wasn't still racism between now and then, but we understand that racism has evolved and has become more covert than it was maybe 40 years ago. We got dog whistle politics and microaggressions. And these terms were created to bring in the nuances of racist language under the umbrella of racism without making people think that we're immediately talking about segregation or some giant caste system. As I said before, and I have to say it again because I think it's important, we have concrete definitions of racism and we can see it play out in the world around us when it comes to things like policy. But each of us as individuals carry our own personal history and internal context when it comes to a word like that. And it's gonna mean something different and make us feel differently depending on that context and history, that personal context and history. Speaking of feelings though. Feelings so deep in my feelings, you know that I like it. So I'm gonna put the notes away and just talk to y'all for a second because when I was watching this video of Sharon Osbourne having this tantrum, I, it triggered me. Like I was not, I was not happy about it because I really did not like the way she was speaking to Cheryl. Because when the conversation started, Cheryl was very much trying to use call in culture. So I really would like to know, cause I've been knowing you for years Go since on. I've been here and I've never seen anything come out of you other than if I don't know, I'm willing to learn. She was talking about Sharon as her friend. She was trying to give the audience as much information about Sharon as possible, saying, you know, as long as I've known you, you've always asked and been like, if I don't know, teach me, you know, been very open to learning. Like she was really doing her due diligence and being very careful with her words because she did not, clearly she did not want people to see Sharon as, as this bigoted person or anything like that. Like she was being very mindful of that, Cheryl Underwood was. I'm talking to a woman who I believe is my friend and I don't want anybody here to, to watch this and say that we're attacking you for being racist. And, and, that, and, and for that, if I articulated I think it's anything, too late. I think that okay. seed's already sown. But that, that is why I'm saying for me, 
I'm saying for me, for me. So when Sharon started cussing and freaking out at the mention of the word racist, just around her, not even about her, it, it just made me feel very uncomfortable, but also reminded me, their whole exchange reminded me of Dr. Mark Brackett's display rules. I did a video on this. It seems like I'm always trying to plug my other videos, but I just feel like they're all connected because I feel like I talk about a lot of the same things just from different angles. But in my video on emotional intelligence and the way we kind of stereotype or police emotions based off of stereotypes, I talked about Dr. Mark Brackett's permission to feel, and he is the director of the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence. He also teaches at Yale and made this book. So I'll just quickly give you the definition of display rules again. Display rules are the unwritten but widely agreed upon guidelines for how, where, when, and in whose presence we may express our feelings. So the reason that I wanted to bring up Dr. Brackett's display rules in the context of this conversation is because Sharon and Cheryl have two very different lived experiences. They would even if they were both white, but Cheryl is black, so here we are. The entirety of this video, Cheryl does not raise her voice once. She stays disciplined, she stays sincere, she stays engaged, even willing to continue to give Sharon grace while she is yelling, ranting and raving, berating people, freaking out. She's still just calm and measured the entire time. And that is because if she started going into a screaming match with Sharon, one, nobody would have gotten anywhere. It would have just been too much. Two, Cheryl, I believe, is a, is a God-fearing woman. So she was talking about how she was using discipline to get through that. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna tell you what God love, and that's the truth. I, I, I thought, I think that this is about discipline. It's about restraint and being a better me. And three, we know about the angry black woman stereotype. And even if people wouldn't have overtly called her angry, dog whistle politics are a thing. And they're just, there's always some sort of tone, which is why I'm always just adamant about us just acknowledging that we're not as good as we say we are or as we think we are. And that there's a likelihood that if you were someone reporting on this and the roles were reversed, there would have been different coverage of how the events unfolded. People are still dragging Sharon, but just in the way the media would have talked about it, if Cheryl had raised her voice even just a little bit, it would have been a heated blah, 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 and this, that, and the other. And she, she knew, so she stayed calm the entire time. Sharon, on the other hand, was doing the most. Cursing, ranting, raving, doing all of that. And that is because with the display rules, when, where, and how you're allowed to express your emotion, that also carries into in what body you're in and how that body dictates how you're allowed to express your emotion. Not from you, but from the way the world around you is. These are my thoughts about uh, white femininity in general. It's why I have so many qualms about uh, the word woman in this side of the world, which I will talk more about next week in my women, women, whatever video. There's this centering of white femininity. And as a result, because of, and I guess we can just continue to go into the next section of the fault of the default, because white is seen as the default, as, as the standard to which everything is measured by, as the centralized core in a lot of these conversations, it makes it a problem for anyone that is not white to live through this world. And what I mean by that is Pierce Morgan and Sharon Osbourne don't understand why the language used about Megan, the dog whistly microaggressions she faced and some macroaggressions, they don't understand why that language was racist or how it was racist. Because to them, they just think, oh, Megan is just another girl who's an American divorcee. And that's why people were upset. Not because she's half black, she's so light, whatever, and yes, because she is so light-skinned, she was able to marry someone like Harry because if she was around my complexion, I, the way the media would have covered her would have been even more insane. One article that I had read talked about how years and years ago, she would have been the kind of woman that was Harry's mistress, not his wife. So 
I'm just saying. And I know that there are some royals that have married women who have darker skin tones, but those people are not in the public eye as much as Harry is. So it's a different situation altogether. But anyway, going back to my point, because white is seen as a default, people like Pierce Morgan and Sharon Osbourne, they do the whole colorblind thing that I talked about in identity conscious casting where they're like, if I don't see race, I can't be racist. If I don't, if I don't acknowledge that you're different than me, then I can't, I can't possibly be discriminatory. Like, how am I racist? I'm not racist. The first step is always self-awareness. Like people say ignorance is bliss, but not, not all the time. To ignore someone's race, to ignore any parts of someone's identity ignores the experience that they live through in this world as a result of that identity. If white is a default and you're anything other than that, if white male is a default and you're anything other than that, there, there's no even playing field from jump. That's just how it works. That's why people talk about equity versus equality because equality is like acting like everybody is the same and we just treat everyone the same and that's not how things work everyone is different so you have to treat people equitably to give each person what they need not give everyone the same thing I think the reason that this got so escalated and so out of control was firstly just because of the perception battle Sharon has a different definition or not a different definition but has a certain type of fixed idea I should say about what racist and being a racist means to her and Cheryl maybe doesn't have that same one so already the minute the word racist is brought into it you have two people that are coming from different positions not communicating to each other okay and I mean Sharon should have done this what do you mean by racist? Can you explain that language to me? She, I think she was trying to ask that, but she was very much like, educate me, educate me. I don't understand what's right. Oh, how is he racist? How is he racist? What did he say? Like looking for proof instead of trying to understand, okay, maybe just explain to me why you feel this way or why other people feel this way. Not what did he say? What did he say? What did he say? Cause it's not about what it's about living in a world where even if the thing someone's saying isn't quote unquote racist. The fact that somebody, a racialized person has to question that means that we're not, we haven't done our job about creating an equitable society. That's just, but that was one of the main reasons first off. So the communication just fizzled out from there. Then you have Cheryl doing her best to deescalate the situation, to make sure that everything is calm, everything is collected. And Sharon is obviously still irate, still carrying other drama into this, still going off, off, de defending her friend, but mostly defending herself and being more concerned about not coming across as racist than actually just learning. She kept saying, educate me, but she didn't actually want to be educated. She just wanted to make sure people didn't call her racist and that she wasn't canceled. The other thing that I want to point out about this interview that I found very interesting and was very like, of course, about was the fact that when one of the other hosts started to speak. Do I agree with what he said? No, like you. No, I do don't I agree. think uh, he should have walked off set, no. You could tell that Sharon was softening and the other host that was speaking was a white woman. To me, I don't know, leads me to the theory that I strongly believe that yes, you can talk candidly about race and racism to people of all colors, sure. But people are going to, in my opinion, believe or listen more to people who share similarities with them physically because it makes them feel more comfortable. I can, in the nicest way possible, explain to a white person why something they did was racist. And maybe they'll understand and they'll listen, sure. But there's, there's, there's still gonna be a defense or a guard up or something there. And that's what was happening. Like Cheryl didn't do anything wild and was trying to explain as best she could to Sharon, but she was still feeling irate. Whereas when the white host was talking to her, she like softened and was like, uh, no, of course, I don't agree with this person, whatever. And it was just an interesting observation to have. God, I don't even know what this video is about anymore. Yo. Okay, but what could you have said to her to calm her down? Like, what do you think anyone in that room, any of those interviewers, could have asked her to calm her down? Literally nothing. <laughs> like, I, I don't think that anything anyone said would have calmed her down. I think the minute the R word, <laughs> racist, was uttered in her vicinity, she was like done. Like, she was like, ready to freak out because everyone's so scared of quote unquote cancel culture and all of this stuff. In the climate that we live in, 
you're so afraid to say something wrong, especially because you know that it'll be immortalized on the internet, out of context, all of that. Although with this interview, it wasn't context. We had four minutes of context. Yeah, her fear outweighed her desire to learn. It's not to say that she didn't want to learn. She was saying, educate me. And I believe that she believed that at the same time, like she was more concerned with not looking racist than actually like learning. I really think that if someone had said, okay, what are we, what are we saying racism is? How are we defining racism and made an operational definition of it? Okay, I'm gonna put a, the definition of operational definition down here for y'all. Cause I just heard about this too. Avery just showed me. But this is why we friends, man. Because that's exactly what I think. Like, I'm not gonna argue about the fact that the stuff that Meghan Markle was dealing with was racist. I'm not gonna argue with anyone about that, it was. But if you wanna talk about how was it and what are we defining, what is your definition and perception of racism? Not necessarily even your definition, but what is your ideal of it? Based off of, as I mentioned earlier in the video, how each of us have our own internal history and context with a lot of these words. And language changes and evolves, yes, but we all have a personal history with language. What means something to me and how that meaning manifests in my life and how I view it and how I interact with other people with it is gonna be through my perception, just like yours will be through yours. Yeah, I don't know the reason I'm not ranting and raving and yelling at <laughs> Sharon is not because I don't, think that she should be held accountable and that sh <laughs> girl, why are you friends with Pierce Morgan? I'm kidding, I don't know him, whatever I mind. I just think that it's important. If we wanna make any sort of change, we need to actually start to talk to each other. And I'm not operating under a respectability politics. Like Cheryl Underwood had God on her side, had Beyonce, and, and every, Jesu Christe, man, like she had everybody on her side to sit through that and not get as riled up in the emotion because that's the other thing. I, I said this to my sister the other day, it takes two people to fight. If you are yelling and yelling and yelling and trying to fight with somebody and they're not letting you have that, you're, you're just yelling at someone for no reason. Sharon didn't have a fight. She just had herself throwing a tantrum while everyone sat back and gave her the space to do it, which a lot of, of especially women of color do not get that same space or grace. So even in doing this video and giving her a bit of that, I still am mindful and aware and annoyed about the fact that if the roles were reversed, apart from other, let's say, <laughs> black commentary channels and blah, 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 and some, some white allies maybe, apart from that, most people would still be treating Cheryl a different way because of, as I said before, display rules, because of the way we dictate how certain bodies are allowed to express emotion and the stereotypes that we associate with certain bodies and the emotions that they express and the limits that we put on real human beings just because of these dumbass constructs that are not real. Everything is made up. This is the matrix. Is that how I end it? It's a lie. <laughs> is that why the books are different? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so this was a bit different from my usual, uh, just me talking more about a situation that's happened and not diving so deep into as much research as I usually do. Because listen, doing this every week, y'all, it's a lot. And I am looking into, I have a couple of people that I will be looking to have fact check for me and help me do research so it will be more manageable, but it's a lot. So sometimes I need to just talk about what happened during the week and, and shove some sociology into it. <laughs> um, but yeah. I think the camera did the thing where it's focused on my face now and the background. Oh, should I have just been sitting closer to the camera this whole time? Well, maybe it thinks you're the background. No, no, no. It's focused on my face, but the background is a bit more blurry. Yeah, you know. Listen, I haven't been doing YouTube for a year, so I'm I'm learning. We're learning and growing. Mistakes. You love the mistakes. We're learning and growing. Sharon Osborne, this was a mistake, a big one. And you can learn from this now, hopefully. Oh. <laughs> Look at us tying everything together. Look at this. Full circle. Full circle. Anyways, feed your pets, water your plants, and remember that you can always change your mind because you can, okay? I will see y'all in the next one. I need to put this glass down so I can give you some kisses. Bye. Bye.
Somebody's asking you to drop your skincare routine, and I'm like, she fucking rubs oil on her face. <laughs> oh wait, where's my phone? Uh oh. Uh -oh. Fuck. <laughs> she said, just dumb luck. <laughs> then I know there was a ghost in your apartment. I take offense. I have a skincare routine now. Mm -hmm. I thought I saw one in the, oh, bathroom, the bathroom today. Open now. Yeah, I saw it. You came in and you said, I need some lotion for my hands, and then you finish it off on your face. <laughs> <laughs> Bell to answer. Wait, do I want to wear a different ring? I don't know if I should put that in here. <laughs> Timeline of events. We love not being afraid to be wrong. Avery, you are a white person. I do not know if that's gonna curl okay. all the way over. Take it away. <laughs> I should be happy laughing, but all I do is cry, cry, cry. No more laughter. Oh, I should be happy. I need to actually record what a difference a light makes. I need to make sure I get a chair like this in my apartment.